So here's what I'm thinking about today. Last week, the US Supreme Court ruled that it's not legal for companies to hold private patents on individual human genes, which is a big deal and I blogged about it last week. It means a lot, not only for women who've had breast cancer or may have breast cancer in the future, but for scientific research in general. This was a lawsuit by several groups, including the ACLU, my old employer, and it's something they started while I was there, so it was pretty exciting to see us win. The two genes in question are so closely linked to breast cancer that women who tested positive for them, like Angelina Jolie, generally have preventive mastectomies rather than risk the future development of cancer. I feel like we should have a moment of silence here for Angie's breasts, even though I'm really glad she's going to be alive and well for a long time. But of course Angelina Jolie is a wealthy celebrity who had no problem affording these tests. And therein lies the problem. For 30 years, companies controlled these kinds of patents, which meant if you wanted to do any work on these particular genes, you had to go to those companies and get their permission. And you can imagine how willing most companies are to let their competitors work on their patents. But what really got me thinking is how this started. See, in 1982, the really early days of sequencing the human genome and identifying what these genes do, there were some researchers at the University of California, and somebody said to them, hey, you should take these breast cancer genes you just found, and you should apply to patent them. And of course, that idea seemed ludicrous to anybody who actually understands how patents work. See, a patent is intended so that when you invent a new product, a competitor can come along and just imitate your design and steal all your hard work and start selling the same exact product, except as their product. But patents are specifically not supposed to protect naturally occurring products, like you can't patent air and you can't patent water. You can't go into a mountain and dig out a chunk of coal and patent coal and say from now on, I'm the only person who can burn or sell or dig or develop any product that works with coal because I own coal. So when someone suggested to these researchers that they apply for a patent on a naturally occurring human gene, they thought, that's crazy. The patent office will never approve that. But the lawyers said, well, try it anyway. And lo and behold, the patent office approved it. This led to 30 years of other companies trying to discover as many human genes as they could and patent them. So somebody could own the gene that deals with, you know, baldness and someone else could own the gene that deals with fatness and someone else could own the gene that deals with sweatiness or whatever it is. You know, all these undesirable things are desirable things. Like here's the gene that leads to, you know, really nice pecs. Companies owned those, even though they naturally occurred, even though they might be in my body or your body, I don't have the really nice PEC gene. And they can tell us that we can't do research on them, we can't develop tests for them, and if we want to get a test to tell us, for instance, if we're going to develop breast cancer when we're later in life, we have to go to these companies and pay them whatever they're going to charge because they have the patent on that gene. What's really interesting to me right now is how that originally got approved by the patent office. See, I had the privilege to talk to a number of really intelligent intellectual property lawyers. Those are lawyers who work on things like patents and copyright and ownership of ideas and, and products. And their theory is that when that initial application in 1982 arrived at the patent office, the patent clerks read it and they just didn't know what they were reading. I mean, this was 1982 and they were talking human genetics. You know, this was crazy new science that no one had encountered yet. And these are patent clerks. These aren't geneticists. These aren't scientists. And they're very smart people. Don't get me wrong. If there's any patent clerks out there, you guys are great. But they're just not equipped to, to understand this kind of science. So what interests me is this ties back to why we in the United States invest in public education. So you'll hear people all the time saying how they don't think they should have to pay for public education because they don't have children in school, which is just one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. But you don't win arguments by just telling people they're stupid. You actually have to have examples. For 30 years, research into breast cancer and testicular cancer and any other cancer and any other disorder that your genetics affect. All of this has been held back because individual companies control those individual patents, which means only one company can be doing research on any one thing at a time, and if other companies want to do it, they have to ask permission, they have to pay. So one has to wonder how much we might have discovered, how much medical science might have advanced in the last 30 years if the patent office in 1982 had looked at these applications and said, hmm, hey, this is a naturally occurring product, there's no way you get a patent on this. And that's why we talk about the need for public education. Because public education doesn't just benefit the kids that are getting the public education. Public education benefits all the people that are going to be depending on those people in the future in ways they'd never imagined. But ultimately, that's like the least of our problems. When we're talking about 30 years of scientific research being held back, what if that person in the patent office had been educated enough not to understand all the theoretical uh, science behind the genetics, but to look at it and say, hey, this is a gene you pulled out of some person's body and that means it's naturally occurring, and that means, no, you can't have a patent on that. You can have a patent on your test, and you can have a patent on the methods you use to extract this, and all of that, by the way, is still protected by the Supreme Court. And if you've made up a gene and, like, sequenced and created a new gene uh, that doesn't naturally occur, that, that you can't just pull out of someone's body, 
You can keep the patent on that too. That wasn't struck down. That would have been 30 years of scientific and medical research. And no offense to you patent clerks who were working in 1982. I realize you were doing the best you could do. But these things all tie together. It's not just some bleeding heart liberal thing where I want everybody to have free education. I realize that my life is going to be dependent on the education received by people all across this country and across the world, frankly. And my future is going to be shaped by the investment that this country makes in education and, and science and math and literature and music and art and sport. So that's it for today. I'm interested to know what you think about all this, so I'll post links to the information about the case down here. Please try to keep it courteous and somewhat coherent. I realize we aren't going to solve this education problem today. And if you're interested, there's more information on my blog, on the ACLU's blog, and like in every newspaper uh, in the country. This was kind of a big story. So thanks for watching, thanks for thinking, and we'll check back again soon.